Okay, we're here with Jim Abernathy. Um, Jim, can you tell us what you do and how your journey began, please? Well, um, I am a conservationist at heart, although that involves many different aspects because of the dire needs of our planet for conservation. Um, I chose probably the most hated animal on the planet, which is the shark, which I happen to have been fortunate enough to grow up with and am out trying to show their true nature to the world. I do this in a myriad of different ways. I take 10 people every week somewhere with little sharks on planet Earth so that they can experience ones like the one behind me that's a 15 foot tiger shark, my friend of of 22 years that is now on her 10th pregnancy since I've known her. And to me, she's just, well, you can probably tell from that photograph, she's just like your puppy dog that follows you around looking for love and affection. Um, I also do presentations all over the world. I'm a, a award-winning author, publisher, um, um, and cinematographer and photographer. So um, I try not to let anything out until it's perfect, which is difficult sometimes. You know, that's one of my downsides is it may not get done for a long time, but when it gets done, it will be amazing. Um, and uh, in the in the pursuit of trying to save what few animals we have left on planet earth which i'm not sure that very many people know that when i was born if we said that that was you know 60 years ago 100 percent of the wildlife we only have 28 percent left so that's an alarming fact and if you look at all the animals that have been wiped out i don't believe any other animal other than the shark has been wiped out in such huge numbers as sharks have by people and the reason that that's so important is because it, it doesn't matter where you live on the planet. You could be in Ohio. We are all dependent on our oceans, sort of the heart of our planet. It provides over 50% of the air we breathe and over 70% of the ox, over 70% of the, the uh, protein that we eat. Um, so it's important that we keep the regulator of healthy oceans, which is sharks, um, abundant uh, on the planet so that they can do their job, maintain the heart of our planet. Um, well, fortunately, I grew up with sharks, not knowing that uh, where it would lead me down this path. Um, and most, one of the most remarkable things that I've had uh, once I moved from land to the ocean in 1998 was the discovery of the affectionate side of sharks something that most people would not believe at all. I mean, if you think about this from a different perspective, I don't know a single person on the planet that teaches anyone how to make friends with any predator. How strange it is that I'm the first one and the animal that I'm using is the most feared animal on the planet, the shark. And I teach people on a daily basis how to make friends with sharks without feeding them to the point that the shark follows them around, basically hunting them down in order to get love and affection. The exact opposite of how they're portrayed in most uh, most shark films. So well, you told us so much in that. So I there's so many questions in my head. Just a general question before I go back into how you create that friendship is how, what's the sort of rough estimate of how many sharks are killed each week or day? And what's the rough estimate of how many shark attacks there actually are against humans in the world? Um, the estimates on how many are killed is between 73 and 250 million per year. Um, let's just take the middle of the road and then that would equate to 110,000 um, per day, which is about three a second. So the uh, it, it's a staggering number even to try to comprehend, and yet we call them the man-eater. Um, if you look at the, the statistics, which are very easy to come up with, uh, worldwide, about 80 people are bitten by a shark each year. And from that, the average is just under six per year die from that bite. But if you look at it in even more detail, you'll find that it's not actually a shark attack. It's a shark mistake. 
If it was an attack, the shark would actually finish the meal. But it bit us and spit us back out because we are not on the food chain of sharks. And, and so it's actually a misnamed. It's actually a shark mistake. So it seems strange that we have aligned this shark as a mindless man-eating monster when the truth is they're beautiful sentient creatures that are very similar to our dogs um, and respond favorably to affection like our dogs do. Now the domestic dog, which nobody is worried about in the United States alone, bites uh, four to five million people per year, basically a bite every 40 seconds, 16 to 20 people a year on average die just in the United States, a much more dangerous animal. Um, I know some people would say you're comparing apples to oranges. Well, if you, if you just talked about ocean and what's dangerous in the ocean, uh, people um, have said, oh, what about that shark attack that just happened in Florida? Are you going to stop swimming with sharks? And, and the truth is, um, looking at the statistics, the much bigger statistic would be that 7,000 people a year die from riptides. So based on that, if you were a real safe person, you wouldn't go in the ocean. You probably wouldn't go outside either because you can't even begin to look at things like car accidents or, or power tool accidents or all these other accidents. You know, we have fatalities in every state in football, soccer and cheerleading. But nobody ever thinks about stopping these sports that are so devastating to so many communities. Yet we have so few fatalities from sharks worldwide. Yet every time it happens, people are thinking, wow, how can you do that? And, the, the, you know, it's just a case of misrepresentation as well as greed. You know, we were wrongly brought up, in my opinion, to believe that the key to success is financial uh, stability. And, and in my mind, that's completely wrong. The key to success is happiness and the key to happiness is gratitude so so how do you how do you become happy well i think the best way to become happy is to be in total service of of animals or people both that that you expect nothing in return that level of of giving um, based on the concept which is so true love conquers all if you if you approach life like that and look for opportunities to help people and animals, your life is filled with happiness beyond what you can ever imagine. You know, just just yesterday, I did a wire transfer at, at a bank and, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm busy. And I walked in, and I gave her the information. I'm sitting down at her desk and because it takes her a little while for the computer to pull up. She said, she said, how was your last trip? And quickly, my mind rifled through spending time with that 15 foot tiger shark behind me um, uh, who was there the entire time. I was fortunate enough to spend three hours with her completely alone. Nobody else there to to look after or anything like that. And um, and I was brought to happy tears because of the gratitude uh, that I feel because, um, you know, she's been my rock to get through my divorce, my father passing away and all these difficult times. Now, what have I done for her? I've removed four books without taking her out of the water. To me, minuscule things compared to the happiness I received by helping animals as well as people. So my life has been about being in service of others, both wildlife as a conservationist and people looking for opportunities to help people. The, the key to a successful life is happiness. And if we could get off of that forefront of the key to success is financial stability, then we could solve a lot of the world's problems. You know, one sixth of the planet is starving to death. And we choose to um, imprison uh, agricultural animals and give them uh, all the antibiotics and whatever they need for health so we can exploit them, harvest them and eat them rather than doing what's right, which is to 
take care of the one sixth of the population that actually needs the food uh, rather than than the the agricultural animals. But we're diverging. Sorry about that. I just uh, uh, wanted to bring that up. <laughs> no, but it's all the same. Um... It, it all it works together. It all it all makes a lot of sense. And I really enjoy listening to your vision and seeing it, how it all links together. So I want to ask about how you understood how to make friends with a shark. I mean, what was the first step? How did how did the shark that you're talking about that's in the photo behind you? How did that relationship start? What how did you what um, did you recognize? Sure. Sure. Well, um, you know, uh, at the time, 1998, um, I purchased a live aboard dive boat and was going to live at sea 25 days a month. I've been living at sea 25 days a month since 1998, running these back to back shark trips, either on my boat or somewhere else in the world, um, as well as, you know, whales and dolphins and, you know, all orcas, all kinds of animals. But um, basically showing um, the the, the scary animals are not that scary at all once you get to know them. But with the first one, um, I, like most people, felt empathy for a one-eyed shark um, that I named after the funny movie uh, Captain Ron, where the main character is missing his left eye. Well, this shark, a, a nine-foot lemon shark, is missing its left eye. And I didn't think it would survive because nature is pretty cruel. If, if, if you make a mistake, you could be taken out pretty quickly. The, you know, uh, prey and, the prey and, pre and predator relationship is sometimes a little fierce. Um, and I didn't think that this shark would make it. And three years later, this shark uh, swam in um, with a hook through its jaw, through its head. And, and and I thought, oh my God, first it loses an eye, now it's got a hole through its head. And as the shark swam with its head going back and forth, it was cutting a hole. And it, to try to get you to understand how I look at this, these are my dogs. And one of them comes home with a hook through its head. If that happened to you, you would grab your dog and get that hook out of there and take it to the hospital. Well, I can't quite do that. Um, but I did think about how I could get the hook out. And um, I've always believed that animals had a seventh sense, if you will, that they can tell if you're a good person or a bad person. In fact, I believe that's why I'm so successful with uh, getting people up close with a variety of different animals. But that's a whole other story. So on this specific day, um, I, I put myself in a position that the shark would swim by me a lot. And uh, like trying to make friends with a dog you don't know. I put my hand out and as it swam by, but the reason I put my hand out is because this sharks can feel this, even though we can't, their lateral line system, they look at, at a hand moving towards them as aggressive. So I put my hand out on the current and when the shark swam by, I rubbed its head at first it was afraid, but as it swam away, I know it realized like, wow, that kind of felt good. It turned around and, and I was actually training them on a hand signal. Um, which is rubbing your thumb to your fingertips like this. The hand signal came instinctively because um, my wife, when I was married, wanted a, a large parrot. So I bought her a large parrot and got divorced. And my bird sitter uh, uh, said, said uh, you know, I told her, well, the, the bird thinks it's human. If you talk to it, have a conversation all day long and give it a lot of love and affection, you, you, you'll be fine. And, and she said, well, what, what about the beak? You know, the beak's huge. Um, and so I said, oh, I'll take care of that. So if you went like this, this hand signal means, do you want your head rubbed? Instinctively, uh, the bird would put his head down. He wants his head rubbed all the time, nonstop. So instinctively, I did this with the shark. And, and, and within two hours, I had made friends with this shark. By the way, the shark is still swimming around today. Um, with completely healed and I got the hook out in two hours and at that point I looked around there's hundreds of sharks at where I am in Tiger Beach of, of like six different species and I I looked around at all the sharks and made a quick inventory and over 50% had hooks and I thought game changer 
I'm going to make friends with all of them. And I went out on a mission to make friends and remove all their hooks. Now, the pan during the pandemic, the last couple of years, this is the first time I've been there and not found a hook. It took a long time, but I, I removed them all. And now um, when I sink down to the bottom, the sharks that can stop swimming, swim up to me and stop swimming, stand on their pectoral fins just to get their head rubbed. It's, it's an amazing thing to witness. And the ones that are, don't have the ability to stop swimming, like Emma the tiger shark and hammerheads and all kinds of sharks, um, they come back repeatedly. Um, there's lots of, of stuff where you can see um, that's been filmed, uh, tiger sharks and hammerheads uh, chasing me down to get their head rubbed. Um, and so back to the, the, the same uh, mission statement, love conquers all. All you have to do is is uh, have the desire to want to help things, and the animals will sense this. So um, about uh, eight years ago, I tried uh, successfully to make the world's most viral video, a, sh a, a public service announcement uh, about, uh, and basically the theme of it was um, a girl dancing with tiger sharks underwater with no air, no no protection, no mask, no scuba tank, no nothing. And the film I made with Sean Heinrichs and Hannah Frazier, Hannah is the model. Um, and and uh, it is the most, it still is the most viral video the world has seen. It was in 140 countries in 10 days without spending any money. And, and um, it, but during that time, there was a, a, what I call a, a new, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track. Let me go back to where I was headed because there's so many different directions I could go right now. Um, but one, the main one I was starting with was at that point, I just, I, because I had asked my crew to make friends with all the sharks, train them on a hand signal for nine months prior to that shoot. Um, it was so successful that I thought, you know what? I'm going to teach my guests how to make friends with sharks. Um, and that was eight years ago. And, and here we are. Um, I have success daily on every single trip. I would say about 80% of the people that really want to make friends with a shark come on my trip and make friends with, with uh, nine foot lemon sharks, um, which is, that's a big shark, right? And, and, um, and actually go down on the next dive and, and they go, oh my God, it's the same shark. And it's swimming circles around. Sometimes it stops in front of them, sits, stands up on its pectoral fins, just like a dog, begging for affection. So they thrive on it. And this, this so that last eight years, uh, I've not only do I have my three crew, but also 10 guests, I would say 75% of which are making friends with sharks too. That accelerated the rate at which I was able to remove their hooks. And now we we haven't had more than three sharks at a time with a hook. You know the, the hooks are constant. There there more sharks are getting uh, hurt. Uh, the, the, the lucky ones are the ones that wind up with the hooks. The other ones are dead. They get fished out and sold for the uh, brutal um, shark fin soup industry all over the world. I mean, did I answer your question? I forgot what it was. <laughs> um, you answered so many different questions, even ones that I hadn't thought of yet. So, yeah. Abigail, do you, how are you doing? We're doing really well. Gillian, do you want to ask? Oh, Gillian, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The are Abigail. She's uh, Gillian, do you want to ask a question? Um, I'm just kind of wow, taking this all in. This is amazing. The the love, the friendship. I, I've never thought of. I guess I've seen um, you know, little tight little baby sharks and thought oh they kind of look like puppies but I think I'll never be able to not think of um sharks as as eager little dogs now that's that's really beautiful well if you want to see what they're really like the, probably the best film is on Netflix Tales by Light Misunderstood Predators um, shows the affectionate side of tiger sharks uh, sadly my favorite tiger shark isn't in that film but that's okay <laughs> you'll you'll understand that they're all nice uh, because sharks really are nice. Well, oh, it's just wonderful. I'm definitely imagining um, a very cuddly, warm, just energy for this painting. Ugh. Great, great. Uh, go so, ahead. Jim, I want to ask you, um, 
something about how, how do the the people who come on your boat and have these moments where they're interacting with the sharks what do they tell you afterwards how how does it affect how they view the sea and this world that you go to uh well it, it, i get this every week our repeat clients is like 60 70 percent this past week i had a gentleman uh his name's craig and and uh craig uh said i said great you look you look good everything's going well and he said yeah he said you know i didn't tell you at the time i didn't realize how impactful how life-changing your trip would be but i'm a different person and i tell him on the trip that like the one thing i, I can't guarantee you what's going to happen but I can guarantee you that, that the person that comes back from this trip is not the same person that left. And, and you know, because most people, like this, this week, I had a, a producer on the boat um, that asked the typical questions of people that just watch um, uh, sensationalized shark shows. And, and you know, what are the chances that, that, that I'm going to get bit? What are the, you know, all this garbage, um, and, you know, that, that people would ask. Um, and I don't know what type of film he was going to make, uh, but I'm sure it changed. If it was going to be a, a, a sensationalized shark show, I'm sure now it's going to be uh, the truth. Uh, because how can you not tell the truth unless, of course, you have no integrity or moral compass, right? And you're just out for the money. <laughs> and those type of people we don't really need anyway. So uh, it's good to see that that, that uh, shows like Tales by Light Misunderstood Predators are so popular that, that share the truth with absolutely no sensationalism whatsoever. So um, I would just want, a, a thought came to me. Do you dream about sharks? Do you dream about being underwater? Um, actually, I do. Um, you're, you're in an area now that um, I, I want to answer you articulately. So first, let me give you the answer I believe that you're looking for. I absolutely believe um, and, and dream what I want to happen in the films that I'm working on. And somehow they do, with minor exceptions. I dreamed about Emma being in Tales by Light, and she didn't show up. For, uh, that, was a, that was number that would have been film number 15 she showed up for 14 of them but not that one <laughs> so uh, which is sad but there's a, a whole nother there's a whole nother uh, part of this um, I'm going to just touch on it and if you want me to go deeper I will most people do not have the ability to do, to um, tap into the subconscious mind but but for those that do know that there's 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 two two things going on up here um there's the conscious mind the conscious mind is the one that you use every day and it makes millions of decisions that you don't think about like for example if you drive a car one mile you make a thousand decisions quick without thinking about those mm -hmm. and those decisions are worthless they're i mean they, they keep you alive but they're as far as you won't remember them tomorrow mm -hmm. right You'll, you'll forget about them. And then there's the subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind, which I, I can tap into that um, through dreams, um, the subconscious mind is only concerned about what's important. In other words, there's a huge filter. Most of the garbage day to day doesn't get in at all. And I was actually able to learn how to tap into this through a brain course um, that uh, Jim Quick, the brain expert, uh, showed you how to remember your dreams. And at, at first, I, 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 you know, of all the things I was trying to be more productive with my brain, um, at first, I didn't think that that mattered. Um, but I, and I didn't also didn't believe it would work. And I did what he said, and, you know, piece of paper, a pad of paper and a pen next to your bed stand so you can write down what you what you're dreaming as soon as you come wake up. And um, and what I realized was what's really important. My subconscious brain is only concerned about helping others. OK, it's family and friends and animals. 
It's all about helping others. It has nothing to do with my mortgage payment or, or things that, that uh, the financial stability of any of the businesses, or it has nothing to do with that. It's only what's important. And sadly, um, at, at the time, uh, 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 you know, you, you want dreams to be happy. Mine were not. You see, the first thing that, that night, I had gone to dinner with a friend that is not healthy, very overweight. And, and um, because I'm extensively researched, um, I knew how to be in total control of, of your weight, as well as get extremely healthy. Um, and um, so that night, I dreamed of giving him CPR in front of his mom and his girlfriend while he was dying. And the next night, I took him out to dinner again. And I said, hey, I'm going to put this in an email so you know how to do it. I'd really like to give you 30 days to try this. Um, and and I, I kept having the recurring dream. By the way, he never took advantage of the opportunity, but I gave the email to right now, I think there's 38 others that have all lost between 30 and 120 pounds and, and, and got their life on track so that they can do what they want to do and, and maintain a healthy lifestyle, something I'm not known for, nor do I make money on it. But, you know, like I said before, the key to happiness is being in service of others, being able to change someone's life, knowing that they will be on the planet, enjoying the quality of life much longer is a tremendous gift. And and uh, so there's so many, so the, the subconscious mind, by the way, just getting back to my dreams, after that, I couldn't get him to, to help himself. Um, and I dreamed about being at his funeral. That's a terrible thing. Um, and then I had to shut it down because that wasn't good. It wasn't until I started helping a group um, of autistic kids as well as quadriplegics that that um, my happy dreams came back. I dreamed about taking my friends that are in wheelchairs to sit, see um, and float on the surface with, with whales and, and whale sharks and all kinds of beautiful creatures. And now I got my subconscious mind back on track. Let's go happy, right? I don't like these nightmares, but it's about, you know, as I said before, it's about being in service of others. That's what's what's really important. And so have you taken the, the children, the disabled children out to the sea? Not only that, I started a whole nonprofit 10 years ago called Operation Blue Pride. It's a, a nonprofit that teaches wounded warriors um, not just how to scuba dive so that they can see the underwater world, but also um, to give them something that they're they're missing, which is purpose and passion. Purpose and passion, in my opinion, are the two things that everyone needs in order to really feel accomplished. It's not financial stability it's it's why are you here what what is your purpose and and if you're passionate about it oh my god you're unstoppable and and that's how i feel you know because there's you know such a diversity uh look i, I wrongly told you uh award-winning cinematographer photographer author publisher the truth is none of that matters none of it what matters is how are you changing the planet? How are you altering the course of our planet into a sustainable direction so that we still have the all the animals as well as those that are starving are not starving? How do you impact the planet in such a significant way that you know the planet is changing into a better direction? So. No, I, 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 everything you're saying aligns with what the show is about. There's, I just want to just quickly go back to the, about the dreams. You, you were able to consciously dream and you are now able to reconnect to lovely visions of what you can, that you could then bring into the world. So, um, are you, so again, back to, are you able then to manifest these, dreams into reality 
you're actually doing that. So you've got this. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I can't explain it. Yeah. But just um, say I, it anyway. When, when I wake up in the morning and yeah. walk out to on my boat, you know, 25 miles from the closest land and walk out and say, I feel really good. I say this to all the guests. I feel really good about today. I, I dreamed Emma came back from vacation and, and she's going to be part of what we're doing today. And she is, by the way, the last time I did that was last week. La you know, Emma, um, this may sound really crazy, but Emma normally takes a, a pre-scheduled vacation January 1 to March 1. For 17 of the 22 years I've been with her, that's her schedule. I don't know where she goes, um, but the whole time I'm concerned that, you know, she could be killed while she's gone. She's no longer under my boat where I know there's, there's no kill shark killers around, but, um, uh, but now her schedule has changed. And last week I had been dreaming about, um, uh, Emma being there, you know, Craig that I mentioned earlier, um, saw Emma and was just so touched that he could connect with a 15 foot tiger shark. That's looking at him eye to eye, connecting with his soul seeing what kind of kind soul that craig is which he is um if you if you knew him like i do um and then 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 uh, going to sleep you know i i pray and and what I'm, maybe that affects my dreaming i said i hope that emma is here this week for craig boom i dream about it there's craig and emma in my dreams i, I wake up craig got up early and and I said, yeah, I think she's going to be here. And she is. She was there the whole week. So we had real quality times. So I do believe in the power of positive thinking um, and, and how you can change your life based on, on um, certain things that you can do to set yourself up for success. Success being happiness, not money. Um, you know, I mean, I get... Uh, probably three or four questions um, a week from uh, mostly college students asking me, how was I able to follow my dreams my entire life? And I try to give them a plan so that they can uh, follow their dreams because um, I was taught improperly. Um, uh, um, actually, this lesson by my father, which I corrected uh, before he passed, and that was, he, my father told me that when I told him I'm going to get into the diving industry, um, he uh, looked into it and told me a couple mornings later, I have coffee with him every morning when he was alive. And, and basically he said that the, he said, basically, do, do you know anyone that has a ping pong table? And I, I said, no, why are you, why do you ask that? He said, well, I looked at the diving industry and more money was made in ping pong ball sales in the United States than the entire dive industry. This is 40 years ago. And, and so I think you're going to, you need, you need to learn this lesson that you work where you have to, so you can play where you want to. Thought, wow. That doesn't sound like a very good life. Um, and, and I, continued into the diving industry. And about 10 years later, when I was Florida's largest dive boat operator, which by the way is a mistake, quality of life goes down when business becomes too busy. But, but uh, I said to him, you were close. Now I've created a life where I work really hard at playing exactly where I want to. Don't really need a vacation. I'm on vacation. It's my job. That's such a good quote. I love Isn't that. it? Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm glad I was able to explain that to my father. So, um, And for years, I would say probably the first 15 years of living at sea, I didn't have any desire to go on vacation. It, it, you know, um, I just wanted to go back on, on the boat again. because, And I couldn't wait for the guests to get on. I had to wait for them to leave. You know, because I can't afford all this expensive boat and all this other stuff. Um, you know, it's it's a it's quite a big deal. But then I finally resorted down. Actually, um, uh, you'll you'll find this. This goes back to love conquers all. I decided I'm going to go on vacation. One of my first vacations, 
after living at sea for a dozen, 15 years, I wanted to uh, look at another predator, the grizzly bear. So I, I, I Googled highest density of grizzly bears. I'm going to cut this short because we could talk for hours, I'm sure you realize. Um, and I wound up uh, doing one bear trip, which was the wrong place. And then I went to polar bears, met a bear scientist who told me, told me something that's so critical as a wildlife photographer. And that is, um, he said that I went to the wrong place looking for grizzly bears um, after he asked me what what the, the basis for, uh, what do you think of the human grizzly bear relationship from a danger perspective? I said, I think if you get within 12 feet of a grizzly bear, you're risking your life. And he said, you, you made a critical error. If you wanna see the true nature of any animal, you have to go to a place where they're not hunted. I said, where are we going, <laughs> right? And that summer I went to Katmai National Forest. And on day on day one, this, this huge, actually I can show it to you, this huge, um, uh, this huge uh, grizzly bear came up to me and I'm gonna show you the picture of her, she's so beautiful. Um, she came up to me and she sat down like six feet front of me. And, and um, I'm there with two of my genius friends, Al Benjamin and Eric Chang. And, and lots of things are going through my mind, most of which was survival, because this is, you know, close to a thousand pound grizzly bear. And, and she's sitting six feet, six feet from me. So I don't know if you can see her. Can you see her? There you go. You see yeah. her, right? So uh, there you go. That's better. Right? Anyway, so so um, she sits down six feet from me and I'm, I'm looking at this thing. I'm, I'm sweating and it's not hot out. I'm scared to death. And, and all kinds of things are, are going through my head, some of which are somewhat comical. If you're going to go to look for large predators, don't invite two people that are clearly smarter than you. Right. Because they're on the inside. I'm on the outside. I'm the grizzly bear alarm. Anyway, I see I see this bear and she's looking at me and, you know, I, I study wildlife behavior. She's looking at me and I'm through my brain. I'm, I'm thinking, am I supposed to look at her in the eyes or is this like gorillas? Were you supposed to be submissive? I didn't really get a briefing on how to do this properly from my, my bear biologist. Right. And he thinks he's somewhat of a comedian. And, and he says, Jim, I suppose you're wondering how, how, you know, um, the difference between a green, a mean grizzly bear and a nice grizzly bear. I said, which one is this? Just tell me which one this is. Right. And, 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 uh, also what type of self-defense I'm carrying. And, 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 uh, and I said, just pass it to me, whatever you got, pass it to me. It's, it's like got signal flares and pepper spray and uh, the mean grizzly bears, well, they're chewing on, on signal flares and they smell like pepper spray. Not funny and not funny at all. But anyway, the bear looked at me and then the bear looked at my friend one of my best friends. And, and uh, I said uh, to Al, I said, listen, we may be best friends, but if that bear lunges, I just want you to know you're on your own. I'm out of here. <laughs> so, and then he looked at, at the bear, um, the bear looked at uh, Eric Chang, another brilliant guy. And then the bear looked back up towards the grass and for long enough that I actually turned around and looked to see what is this bear doing, right? Something's going on. And it was it was at that that point that one second it was at that point that that um, these two baby bears these two baby bears um, uh, stumbled out of the grass. They were scared to death. Little tiny things, you know, little little tiny things. And I mean, you could put them in the glove box. They're that small, right? So, so they they leaned against each other, scared to death, and they walked out there, and and they they uh, went all the way out to where mom was. She's six feet from me, right? Way too close for my personal space. And and the 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 bear put her the mama bear put her head down, and I know she gave the directions to those little bears because they didn't like the directions. The directions were you stay with these people because the other bears are afraid of them. And this, this guy is not going to hurt you. And, and mom turned her back and went fishing with like 20 other grizzly bears that are like a hundred feet away from us. And the bear scientist, by the way, is, is losing his mind now because, you know, I'm thinking love conquers all. 
I'm going to make friends with the baby grizzly bear, right? And 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 he's losing it over there. And and uh, uh, it was uh, we were grizzly bear babysitters for the rest of that day and some other days as well. And the interesting thing was that um, Mama Grizzly Bear um, would catch a fish about every five minutes. And after each fish that she ate, she would look. I don't know if you can see her she would stand up on her hind legs and look at the grizzly bears, which are, I don't know if you can see, can you see that? So yeah. the grizzly bears, um, the baby grizzly bears are underneath my tripod. And sometimes baby grizzly bear would stand up and look back at her. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? She, so, she looked like a mom at the park trying to check yeah, her kids so good. Yeah, she's checking <laughs> on her kids. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it's an amazing experience, but it doesn't matter where I go or what animal I'm with. It seems like to me, I, I know without a doubt that animals do have a, a much better sense of who is kind and who is not. And and in being with, you know, um, I'm probably at the far extreme, you know, I'm vegan. I don't eat any animal products or do anything um, that would harm any other living creature on the planet. And I think that that um, that really resonates with animals. They get a sense of that. Like right now, while I'm talking to you, behind you is my backyard animal sanctuary. There's hummingbirds on the feeder right here, right right next to us. And living at peace, a true peace, um, especially vegan, um, is such a calmness that comes over you, knowing that that you are contributing to the planet rather than taking something away. So, wow, I just covered so many different directions. We didn't even really talk about sharks that much, but. No, no. Uh, all, all, uh, the, all the directions are perfect because you've given us this beautiful overview and that's, um, it's wonderful. And also um, people can, you know, they can go onto your Instagram, they can read your book. There's so many things that they can dive into your world in different ways after this. Mm -hmm. this introduction to who you are and and how you see life and um for me well, i hope i'm able to uh rearrange my schedule and, and uh, join you for your opening because uh i'd really like to see the rest of the people right the, they got to be really interesting they are really interesting so i'm going to ask one i'm going to actually get jillian jillian ask jim one wrap-up question about anything but not to do with your the painting okay. Jillian, i'm going to say this because this is going to go onto youtube people are going to watch this jillian mm -hmm. is going to be creating a piece of art uh, a portrait of jim in his underwater world so jillian ask jim anything so we uh, as an ending question i would i would ask um as a mom of a little boy who loves everything under the sea um what is kind of your vision of a world where kids learn more about predators and a different what we call predators and scary sharks and stay away from the bears what is your idea of like an education folk something we can incorporate in the way we teach our kids from a very young age to see the world a bit more the way you do with this love conquers all well, everyone um, like a kind happy and they treat you back you know well uh, first of all um when it comes to kids you want to be impactful. So what's available? To me, the, there's only one thing available, but most parents think, okay, here, take your, take your phone and watch something. Take your iPad, watch something. Um, and that's a cop out really. I mean, you, you, you can watch other people do things. So for me, it just so happens I'm, I'm helping a great guy that a, a perfect stranger that, that I saw an opportunity to help. His name is Christo in the process of getting divorced. And, and while he's getting divorced in a terrible situation, he's helping others. He's helping other parents that are going through divorce to, to connect with their kids. And, and I believe what he believes. The best way to connect with kids and teach them What's important in the world is through the direct contact, life-changing experiences, 
forget the iPad, forget the TV, get outside, go connect. It just so happens that tomorrow I will meet with a family of six, four kids. Um, and what we're doing is we're going to the only place in the world where the California, where, where any whale teaches their baby whale how to get love and affection from a human. That's where we're going. Now, do you think that those kids, that this is gonna change the rest of their life? Absolutely. Mom weighs 40 tons. The babies are 15 feet. So, but a little kid on the side of a boat that reaches out and be, is able to rub the baby whale's head and have the baby whale stay there, this is in the wild. It's, it's amazing. And those, it's the only place in the world that, where this happens. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So for me, connecting with kids, look at life-changing experiences. Get outside and enjoy nature. Because sadly, when they grow up, it may no longer be there. You know, we're in the sixth extinction. Only 28% of the wildlife is on the planet that was alive when I was born. And, and we need to change that. More people need to feel empathetic about um, wildlife to the point that they dedicate their lives to the conservation of these animals. That's my advice. Wow. You ready to go? Well, let me say the ticket. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. So Jim, um, I'm before I press pause, um, Thank you so much for being part of our show. And um, I hope a lot of people listen to what you've got to say, because on every level, it ticked every box. It was just brilliant. And I'm very grateful. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be here. And I certainly hope I can join you on opening day in Chicago when it warms up a little bit. <laughs> it's really cold here. Right? It's absolutely freezing. Don't come now. Even I don't want to leave my house. Um, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. So I'm grateful.